I'm, okay, great. Okay, so um, so today we're talking a little bit about uh, we're talking about streaming analysis of live events. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of a practical NLP uh, session today. You know, we're kind of staying high level and talking about a few useful tools that you can use to kind of dip your toes into NLP, um, do some some cool stuff. Um, so. Uh, most more specifically, we're going to talk about a couple of streaming analyses that I did of both the Game of Thrones um, series finale. So the last episode of Game of Thrones, right, which was a very highly emotionally charged um, <laughs> emotional experience for uh, for a lot of viewers around the world, um, and then uh, also the NBA Finals, um, which was a series of you know, you know basketball games here that uh, led to a historic win by a team, the Toronto Raptors, who had not yet won um, a championship. So we'll kind of take a look at these two live events um, and um, obviously it's like what makes it cool about being things that are happening in time, right, at a particular moment in time as we can look to Twitter and kind of see how the conversations are changing um, over the course of those events as opposed to something like you know, a new Netflix series or something, which people might be watching within a few day span, but aren't watching at a particular moment. Here we can really tie things to the moment and uh, see how opinions are, are shifting over time. All right, so um, if we produced a big event, you know, imagine we're HBO or imagine we're the NBA, what kind of things do we wanna know about what the world is thinking about this event that we're, that we're putting on? Um, so of course, like what did people think? What did they like and what didn't they like about moments in the event? Um, what were people most excited about, right? Sometimes um, we're looking for kind of an emotional charge and it doesn't really matter if people are loving or hating, we just wanna know what are people excited about and when. Um, other questions like what are most people saying, right? So now we're getting it a little bit more specifics. Those first batch of questions were just about general emotional you know response right so more of the sentiment analysis things now well what were they actually saying what were the trends in conversation we're diving a little bit deeper into language um, and then finally you know what characters or players stood out so um, you know for for players in the NBA for example like if you're a brand another brand and you want to know well who are people most excited about right we want to get somebody that people are really excited about um, to be our sponsor or spokesperson um, uh, and, and on the fictional front, like in a Game of Thrones type show, or, you know, in this case, I would imagine what if it's like the premiere of a new show, um, you know, who, what characters should we dive deeper into because fans are really responding to them positively. Um, so for the, we're going to use sentiment analysis to tackle the first block of questions, which were that, you know, what did they think? What did they, what did they like? What didn't they like? What were people most excited about? So things that aren't diving too deep into language, but are kind of giving us some general emotional uh, responses. Um, and so a tool that we're gonna use for sentiment analysis is called Vader Sentiment. So it's a rule and lexicon based tool. So there are, um, there are lexicon files with words and emojis, um, and it assigns scores based on how those have been used um, in sentences that were ranked positive or negative by, by people. Um, it's very easy to use. It assigns both polarity, so positivity and negativity, um, and it also takes into account intensity, right? So you can be more positive or more negative. Um, it's not just a sort of binary positive or negative. It also is cool because it handles social media usage and emojis, as I mentioned. You know, you get uh, crying emojis count for negative, <laughs> smiling emojis count for positive, and there's intensity around those as well. Um, it also handles negation. So um, that's one of the things with sentiment analysis, right? You don't, you could just assign values to words and based on the presence or absence of words, assign scores. Um, but Vader is smart enough to handle negation of clauses. So in this example of Vader is not smart, handsome, nor funny. Um, it is able to understand that despite the presence of positive words like smart, handsome, funny, um, the not and nor encompass that clause and make that whole clause be negative. So it's a little bit smarter than just kind of a standard bag of words approach. Um, it gives scores um, 
It gives both individual positive, negative, and neutral scores, and then it also gives a compound score that combines positive and negative and weights them by the neutral score, um, and in the end can give a compound score that ranges from negative one for the most negative to one for the most positive. Um, and the great thing about Vader, it, it is a part of um, an LTK, which is the Natural Language Toolkit, which is a great toolkit for including everything from rhyming dictionaries to um, various language analyzing tools, and I think that's something worth um, worth folks looking at. But it's also great Vader Sentiment is just on its own, very easily installed, just with pip install Vader Sentiment. Um, and then to initialize the Sentiment Intensity Analyzer, all you need to do is import that Sentiment Intensity Analyzer, um, instantiate it right there, as you see on that second line, and then just call the polarity scores method and put your text string, um, feed your text string to it, and it'll give you those scores. So it's actually very easy to, uh, to use. Um, so I wanted to, now looking at some, some commonly stated lines from Game of Thrones this last season, I uh, wanted to look at and discuss a little bit of the nuances of what we can and cannot get out of it. Um, so you're my queen. Uh, Right, it interprets this as an entirely neutral statement. As you see, there's zero negative, zero positive, we're entirely neutral. Um, so I think that's kind of an example of, um, you know, it is a neutral factual statement. Um, but for, for us, right, depending on our feelings about, you know, the, the queen, the person saying it, et cetera, like, um, we add a lot of emotion and a lot of sentiment to statements that are objectively neutral. Um, and I think that Vader takes kind of that more objective approach, right? And views, pure, this is purely factual, right? We're not yet imbuing this with, um, with additional words or, or charged adjectives, et cetera. Um, I don't want it. So now we actually are starting to see some negativity, right? I don't want it, right? So uh, want is probably neutral on its own, but don't uh, infuses this with some negativity. So we actually see the negative score creep up a bit. Um, Steph Curry is a fraud. So now we're on the NBA. Uh, obviously, is a fraud. That's a big. That's a strongly charged negative word. I see we have a question, so let me see if I can access this. Does Vayner sentiment support other languages other than English? Um, you know, it's a good question. I actually don't know. Um, oops. Compound score is. I need to let's see. My mouse isn't appearing here, so I need to get rid of that question box. I might need to pop out of here for a second. Move that over to the side. Um, I'm actually not sure what languages Vader sentiment supports. It's a great, great question. Um, compound is the is a weighted score that combines negativity, positivity, and weights it by a neutral amount. So it's basically if you're looking for one number that describes the overall uh, negativity and positivity that that ranges from negative one to positive one, that comes from compound score. Um, uh, Vader, uh, I don't believe it considers casing. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I, I believe it, it's taking the lowercase version of everything. But I'm not, not a, that might actually be an intensity. Um, it might actually increase the intensity. I'm not, not too sure on that one. Um, so here's another, uh, so here's a, Steph Curry got outscored by Fred Van Vliet and Kyle Lowry at home in an elimination game in the NBA Finals. Right, so that's a sentiment that we understand that there is a lot of sentiment uh, charged in that sentence. But again, this is looking at the limitations of sentiment analysis currently. That is returned as a neutral statement because it is purely factual. But it's, uh, I think, so you know, it's, that's understanding the limitations here. We're missing some subtleties still. Okay, um, another limitation of sentiment analysis right now. When we get a statement like, I love Jamie Lannister, right? So we love this character of Jamie Lannister, and we see a positive, high positive score and a high compound score. Um, but if you also say, I love that Jamie Lannister got what he deserved, um, so, you know, assuming this character may have met, <laughs> you know, may have met an, an end, I don't want to dive into the spoilers too much, but um, that's really kind of negative towards the feeling of that character, right? But it's still, a positive sentence overall. I love that this character, that this thing happened. So I think that's a kind of warning against reading too much into um, 
reading too much into uh, statements that are about a character versus an overall statement, right? It's hard to know, for example, that positive sentences that include a character's name are, are they're not truly positive feelings towards a given character, right? We have to be careful about our interpretation in that regard that we're still looking at. Um, we're still seeing a lot of kind of fuzziness. So I think this is still useful in, for example, an HBO executive um, understanding that there is strong emotion related to this character, but we can't necessarily say people love this character based on aggregating these scores, if that distinction makes sense. Um, okay, so now let's look at a few of these graphs. So the, the vertical dotted lines represent the start and end of this episode. Um, so here we see Tyrion, uh, kind of over the course of the episode, we do see kind of an average, oh, and each dot represents the average sentiment at that minute. Right, so we have a dot for each minute. We've aggregated the sentiment scores, um, and we have the average sentiment score per minute. Um, and we see that over the course of the episode, there is kind of a slight upward trajectory, right? So before um, the episode, Tyrion is kind of generally averaging in the, in the negatives, but over the episode, people kind of, uh, things get positive, uh, go to slight positive trend, and he ends up sort of stable um, just at or above zero over the uh, afterwards. Um, then we see a little dip later into the morning as maybe more of the late night crowd or the West Coasters, uh, you know, dip down and then it, then it recovers a little bit from that dip. Um, Brienne, so uh, Brienne, I think an, an interesting thing to note here, right? We see a huge amount of, of variance in the average sentiment score for Brienne before the episode begins, then things focus in. And again, we see a kind of slight upward trend in positivity for Brienne. Um, but we should not interpret this as um, that scores were wildly, um, you know, people's opinions were wildly varied about Brienne before the episode. Uh, instead, this is kind of what we're seeing here is um, the central limit theorem come into play, right? We're, we're dealing with low numbers of tweets per minute before the episode starts about Brienne. People just weren't chatting about her a lot right before. So instead, what we're seeing is um, just the law of low numbers, right? That, uh, that uh, we're seeing a while, a lot of variety because we don't have enough of a sample to really come to an accurate um, approximation of the true mean that we're after, right? Which is like what everybody is actually thinking internally about Brienne. And we're just seeing a few tweets, so we're just kind of, we have a lot of variance. But as the episode starts, we focus in and we start having enough of a sample as people express themselves on Twitter to start to dial in towards um, a reasonable approximation of this real population mean. Uh, so I think that's kind of a cool effect from, from this approach. Um, now Drogon, <laughs> here we see a more interesting uh, and, and sharper trend, right? So again, we see a little bit of that same focusing effect at the beginning. Um, and then we see some sort of uh, negativity once the episode, um, a little before the episode, and really especially as it begins or, or comes to an end, we see him dip. So people are maybe not so happy. Um, Bran, oh, by contrast, again, we'll see a little bit of that focusing effect as the episode approaches and begins. Um, and then we move sharply upwards over the course of the episode, and especially at the end and after, we're getting a lot of positivity. Um, Okay, so now we're moving on from sentiment analysis into another technique, topic clustering. Um, so we, um, actually before we do that, I wanted to pop out of the presentation and go to a notebook. If people wanna fire in the Q&A uh, a couple of sentences, we can go ahead and kick the tires on Vader a little bit. Uh, if you ask a, a question with, a, with some text you'd like to see, we can just kind of run it through here and see what, what scores we get. Let's see, anybody want to send over a sentence in the Q&A there? What do we have? Okay, we have in the chat, I am hungry. Okay, great, let's see what I am hungry does. I think that's gonna be a neutral sentence here, but yep, see that's a neutral sentence, it's just a fact. 
the flesh is willing, but the spirit is weak. All right, let's see what we've got. Okay, so here we have negativity. Yeah, probably from the weak there. Uh, where can we access the Jupyter Notebook on GitHub? It's not up on GitHub at the moment. Um, this, but you know, there's only a few lines of code here, so um, we can. I can even just copy these and put those into the chat. Just and you'll just want to proceed this with pip install. Um, get your notebook. Okay. Yes. Sure. Is he doing that? Neutral. I married basis on the fifth day of May. I think we're also going to see probably neutrality there, right? So we really need to get charge words. Okay, yeah, I think this IPA is a bit overrated. That's a good one. We'll see if it can. Oh, interesting. That I'm surprised that overrated does not um, does not give us a, an emotion, a sentiment score. Like, I think this IPA is bad, obviously gives us negative. I think this IP is terrible. Hmm. Interestingly, a lower not has charged up as sentiment score. Oh, you're not able to see the notebook on screen. Okay. Um, interesting. Okay, well, let's dive back into the presentation. And uh, I think uh, we, uh, I'm okay to look at the notebook. You can see it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. The only thing is that probably you want to uh, use a larger font because the font is uh, quite a small. It's very small. Okay, I'll zoom back in next, but uh, we'll, we'll dive back into the presentation now. I think that's, I uh, want to cover some other stuff as well. Um, okay, so now let's move on to topic clustering so we can tackle that second block of questions. Um, and I do encourage for sure, you know, by all means, everybody should explore beta sentiment on its own explore what it does well, and definitely be always, with any of these tools, be aware of their limitations too. That's kind of the main point there. Know what it, know what it can do and then and know when you start, you're gonna want to read too much into it, right? We all have that natural, our natural biases that we want to overlay and imagine that we're getting a lot more specific insights than we are, so just be, be careful about that, of course. Um, all right, with topic clustering, we can tackle the second block of questions. So what were most people saying? What were the trends in conversation? Um, to do that, we're going to use um, BERT embeddings. Um, so I imagine most folks here are generally familiar with the concept of embeddings, but essentially what we're doing is um, in order to compare words mathematically, we need to turn them into vectors of numbers, right? We need to, um, and, and the way that uh, we do that is by um, I think what, you know, I forget who said it, but one quote around this is, we will know a word by the company it keeps. Um, and um, we learn based on what other words a word is uh, surrounded by typically, we kind of get a sense of um, how that word is used, you know, maybe whether it's an adjective or a verb, what kinds of words it's used similarly to. Um, and Bert, up until recently, was kind of the best, uh, the best job of, of preparing these embeddings. Now there's a new thing called XLNet that you might want to look into. Um, but uh, BERT uh, translates words into 768 dimensional representations. Um, and um, oh, somebody wanted to see Yes, Sure. Uh, I think we tried Yes, Sure, wasn't that? We'll, we'll pop back over into the notebook and try Yes, Sure in a second. Um, but another great thing about BERT, um, there's another very easy to use. Um, uh, project up on GitHub from Han Zhao, who was the person who also did the Fashion MNIST data set, right, which is a drop-in replacement for the, the MNIST digit uh, classification data set. So if you're kind of looking for something that's a little bit more interesting than handwritten digits, uh, the Fashion MNIST like, lets you identify shirts and pants and things like that, which is cool. And now Han has also released a thing um, called BERT as Service, which um, you see is a very easy to install um, and set up. Uh, it's a Docker file um, that runs, there's two, two containers run that you run, well you run one as a, as a server um, and you can run it with, see this like runtime NVIDIA, you can have like a GPU accelerated version um, and then you just query it. This now you just install the client as well 
um, and in a notebook or in whatever code, it's a pretty easy import statement, um, instantiate the client, and then you can send in a few sentences at a time and get those representations, the BERT encodings, um, embeddings. So um, now we'll pop out of the file again. Um, let's go back and that one, somebody was asking for yes, sure, as a, let me go ahead and expand the font size here. Oops. Yes, sure, let's see. I think we're gonna be, oh. Okay, so we've actually got a posit some positivity there. Um, yes, we can send these slides around after, especially so you can kind of grab those, um, those code snippets and stuff. All right, and so here is one, this was um, on the NBA, um, this is using tweets from the NBA sentiment, and so what we've done is we've clustered this with k-means clustering uh, while it was in that 768 dimensional space. Um, so we've got clusters and then we used, um, TSNE, right, which stands for T stochastic neighbor embedding, uh, to reduce that 768 dimensional representation down to a two dimensional representation for plotting purposes. Um, and you can see that, so what TSNE does is uh, it's a dimensionality reduction tool that um, basically tries to keep things that are close in a high dimensional space close. And when they're far apart in high dimensional space, it tries to keep them far apart. So you see that even though this was clustered in, two, in 768 dimensional space and these colors were assigned, right? The clusters were assigned at that point. It does a pretty good job of even when we smush it down uh, into two dimensional space of keeping those clusters together. Um, so now we can explore a little bit. These are some of the tweets. Um, okay, so over here we have a cluster that we see is French. <laughs> so we have our uh, French voices clustered together. Um, I think down here, um, is this, uh, is this Portuguese? Um, those are there. Now we dive into probably our English clusters. Um, so here we see, right, this, we're probably only getting some sense, uh, meaning from these, the emoji there. Although this is actually Bert. I don't think Bert can handle emoji. Um, let's see what other clusters. Okay. Only thing I hate about tonight's game is that the Raptors went that if the Raptors win, critics will say it's because two stars are out. So we've got some um, frustration there. Um, everyone wants us lose. So the, these, this cluster might be about winning and losing. Um, let's see what else we've got over here. Can, can they recover? Um, things are rigged. The amount of charges is so brutal. Is carrying aloud. So these maybe are a little bit about penalties. Um, eliminated. Um, let's see what else we've got. Defense. <laughs> so some of these clusters, I think, you know, in this particular context, I think we're dealing with a lot of very similar um, statements overall how word embedding is converted to sentence embedding. Oh, great, yeah, great question. So uh, with the BERT as a service tool, um, it can convert uh, word, individual word embeddings to sentence embeddings in two ways. Um, one is it can reduce, so it, calls, it gives you two reduce methods. One is reduce mean, which takes the average, um, and one is reduce max, which takes the, the um, word embedding with the maximum um, vector length. Uh, so you can either kind of take the most salient word or you can get an average. So what I've done is taken an average but first removed stop words. Um, and um, yeah, so, so like first remove stop words because that'll kind of tend to just remove too much noise, right, of all the stop words being commonly used words like also and et cetera that don't really contain a lot of meaning in themselves. Um, and um, yeah, and so uh, so... You, by removing those, you still get some detail in the sentence. Um, <laughs> so here it looks like we've got a little bit more slang kind of cluster together. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's that. And then um, I did another version of this plot that on one axis we're, we're using the word embeddings, on the other axis we're using the sentiment embeddings. So now within a given topic, um, we've got 
both like the positive tweets and negative tweets. And then we see, as we looked at when we were exploring data sentiment, a lot comes across as purely neutral. So within a given topic, um, we can uh, see some things that at least Vader thinks are positive. I only feel what them injuries do now the team. And we see like, I think it's probably the laughing for joy emoji here. Let me make this larger. That's giving this a positive sentiment. Um, must win game. If they lose, the series is over in six, maybe five. Um, so I don't know, you know, this is one a, a place where sometimes Vader, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that we really see that much difference there in the positive and negative. Let's see if we can find somewhere where we, we see a true, a true difference. <laughs> um, so we see some like laughter and things, ha ha's, right? So that's probably pushing it into positive. Um, but here we've got panicking, right? As uh, probably some, but what's pushing us into the negative there? Okay, let's see. I think we've got some more questions coming in. Okay. Uh, do you have to combine Vader with Bert to plot this? Yeah. So this particular plot is using both. Each tweet is we're getting the Vader sentiment analysis. Uh, and there are other sentiment analysis tools, but that's what we're using here, and that's giving us the um, this y-axis, and then uh, we're using Bert, and then we're using that T-SNE that I talked about, the T-S-N-E, um, to reduce now instead of reducing to two dimensions like we had done on this plot, we're reducing to one dimension just to give us different clusters on this plot. Now, I, I do think that in this particular case on the NBA stuff, um, I haven't really found the clustering to be all that meaningful. Um, so again, we're looking at kind of the limitations there, and I think part of it is that a lot of the comments are kind of really about the same thing, right? They're about the, they're, they're jokes about the game, right? It's not as, um, there's not that much different in the topics, I think. But where I have found topic clustering to do some really interesting stuff is, for example, in sentences from reviews, like Yelp reviews or Google reviews, you can get some interesting clustering around things like, um, for restaurants, for example, like sentences that cluster around the food itself and like menu items as distinct from sentences that cluster around service um, and communications with staff, as well as things that cluster around location, for example, and uh, parking situations, et cetera. So um, depending on your topic and kind of how much, the, or the documents that you're analyzing and how much variance you see within that about the different topics, you, you'll see kind of different levels of effectiveness with clustering. And then of course, tweaking the numbers of clusters. So here, you know, maybe we're, we're putting uh, too many clusters. You know, if I was working further on this, I might say, let's try to not look at so many different clusters. Um, and um, and see if we can get a little bit more more detail there. Um, okay, back into the keynote. Okay, so now we're going to talk about kind of the streaming component of it. Okay, so what is the difference between batch and streaming? The main difference is that batch processing you have all of your data, right? It may be a lot of data, but there is a finite amount of data that we are covering all at once. Uh, streaming really just means that we don't have a limit to the data. It doesn't even necessarily mean that there is more data or anything like that, right? It's just that we can't look at it all at once because we never know that we've come to the end of our data. Um, so what that means is we always have to break stream, we have to develop, devise streaming windows that look over the data. Right? In this example, we're looking at one streaming window that follows another, but you can absolutely have overlapping windows where you're always looking at, for example, the last half hour, um, and that last half hour, you know, as you move minute by minute forward, um, you, you know, the, the, you're, you've got a lot of overlap. Um, so you can have different kinds of windows, but you always need this concept of a streaming window. A couple of common tools used to analyze um, streaming data are Spark, um, or in this case, I used Apache Beam, uh, which is an open source Apache project that is meant to de design um, workflows pipeline similar to Spark, uh, but that can run locally or on um, a different runner, as they call it. So Dataflow is Google's 
the GCP runner for Apache Beam jobs. Um, and that's what we used in this case. Um, so the architecture looked a little bit like this. Whoops, vaguely it was, uh, so we, we took tweets via TweetPy in a Kubernetes cluster uh, and published those to PubSub because we knew we were using Dataflow. So uh, PubSub is basically Google's version of Kafka, so a messaging platform. Um, and um, you know, a cool thing is you can assign the timestamp. Um, so uh, and specifically, right when you're when you're doing this kind of windowing, whoops, the time that a thing happens is really important, right? Because that's what we're considering when something fits into a window or not. And so you want to be careful about what that timestamp is. So for, you know, it could be the timestamp that you ingest it into your data processing pipeline. So once data flow reads it, uh, we could consider that our, our timestamp, but it's better if you can get the timestamp of the event itself. So really what we're interested in is the time that the tweet was published, right? Because it might get into our data flow, you know, minutes later. Um, and then have the wrong timestamp. But if we can get the actual timestamp from the event itself, that's better. Uh, and so PubSub allows us to do that, right? It allows us to take the, um, it to, to parse the, the tweet pack payload from TweetPy and find the timestamp that the tweet was published and use that as our timestamp. Um, and then we're windowing over that within Dataflow, conducting our sentiment analysis, conducting our aggregate statistics, which the aggregate statistics right happen only over that window, um, and then we're writing those to BigQuery. So this we won't dive too much into the details of it, but this generally shows you um, right. So we're creating a list of messages uh, for each line of data that we're getting in. We're doing a little bit of um, encoding of that, and we are um, adding the. Uh, we're adding that to, okay, so we're preparing the message. So this is publishing the message. Uh, we're creating the, this messages bit of JSON here, this dictionary, and then we are um, publishing that to a given topic. Uh, so like Kafka, PubSub works with this notion of topics. Um, and we're passing that along. Um, and now here is the pipeline code. So this, um, if you, you see it kind of uses this Unix-like function of the pipe, Right, which pipes one bit, one transformation into the next. Uh, so that's what these vertical lines here represent. Um, and it, uh, Dataflow also gives you, or Apache Beam gives you this option of labeling each function. So these labels, like read from topic, window, emit needed values, are the labels that we're assigning so that as we monitor our pipeline, we can see uh, how each phase is progressing. So basically, we're reading this from PubSub now. We're reading that stream of messages we're windowing, so we're windowing that into our, in this case, fixed windows of one minute in length. We're emitting the needed values, so in this case, we are looking for mentions of a given entity, so mentions of a player or a character in the case of the Game of Thrones stuff, or the name of the show overall, and we're um, emitting the value of the overall sentiment um, of that sentence associated uh, so basically, if, if, it, if a sentence were like, I love Tyrion and Sansa, both Tyrion and Sansa get the score of that sentence overall associated with them. Then we're combining. Now we're combining all the things about Tyrion and all the things about Sansa into uh, an average, but again, only for that window. Um, now we're adding that window timestamp so that we can plot based on you know, the window beginning at this minute, the window beginning at this minute, we're adding that bit of meta metadata. Um, then we're just we're formatting for writing. Uh, I think we were adjusting the um, timestamp format or something at that point. Uh, and then writing to BigQuery. Um, so we're streaming into BigQuery. The cool thing about BigQuery too, and this is also on GCP, um, is that you can um, what you can stream directly into BigQuery, and while data is being streamed in, you can query over that data. So if you're really doing something very real time, um, you can both be streaming into it and querying and getting the latest based on what data has streamed in so far. Um, okay, and uh, you know, so now we're just kind of looking at that pipeline overall again. So we went from Twitter 
Uh, we had a TweetPy client running and published each tweet to a message um, in PubSub. We are with specifically the timestamp of that tweet as the timestamp of the message. Then we're windowing over the data as it comes in, taking things per minute. We're conducting sentiment analysis on it uh, on each message as it comes through. We're aggregating the statistics per window, and then we're writing that to BigQuery. Um, and so this is kind of what the BigQuery table looked like. We, you know, we would the interval start right. So that's the start of that given window, uh, the the entity that we're concerned with, and we did take the lowest sentiment. Uh, tweet that we found, the highest sentiment tweet that we found, and then the average, right? So you see here for brand, there's everything from very, very low to very, very high sentiment uh, and the number of data points that were involved um, in that minute's information about that character. Um, okay, cool. So that's kind of the overview of um, those few things. So we talked about sentiment analysis, we talked about topic clustering, uh, with word embeddings and expanding to sentence embeddings. And then we talked about doing those things, uh, specifically the sentiment analysis piece in a streaming context. Um, so now, I mean, we'll open it up to any questions. Um, other folks, feel free to add other questions in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, the different colors represent, let's see, that must have been back when we were in the topic clustering part. The different colors represented the different clusters that those tweets had been grouped into. And right, so the clusters are an unsupervised method, right? So we're not prescribing exactly how we want these things to be clustered, but the um, k-means was the clustering algorithm that we were using. It is, um, it is finding appropriate clusters based on proximity. Okay, I was curious about the red cluster. It seemed mostly positive. Okay, cool, let's, let's hop out of the presentation and go back to that plot. Let's go explore red. Let's go Raptors, yeah, right? So we're seeing here a lot of uh, positive. This is a must win for the Raptors. This is obviously, clearly we're seeing mostly focusing on the Raptors. The Warriors aren't being mentioned in this cluster. How appropriate that it happened to be red. Um, but we're also seeing some negativity <laughs> about the Raptors right there. Okay, so mainly it's the word Raptors probably that this cluster is really focusing on but tending towards positivity. Let's go if we go to the one that has both the positivity. Yep, see, look, so here we see, um, so we see this, this Raptors cluster that we discovered in that topic clustering, uh, and then here we're seeing those positive ones. Glad I picked the Raptors, Raptors better work. Uh, and then here we've got neutral Raptors stuff, and then here we've got negative Raptors stuff. If the Raptors lose, the Raptors are just staring, but just starring, so they spell that wrong. <laughs> so. Uh, but we do have that that uh, neutral face, but probably is a negative uh, sentiment. All right, let's see what else we have on the questions. How do you decide the number of clusters? Great question. Is it easy to just iterate over and over until the number of clusters look good, or do you use some distance-based metrics to find um, a good number? Um, you can do it both ways. I typically, when I'm doing NLP stuff, like to start with a larger number of clusters. And again, like I mentioned, I, th I think I probably overdid that here. And it, I would from now rein that in a little bit if I was working on this more. Um, I like to start with larger numbers of clusters because I find that some clusters at that point just kind of act as garbage collectors and then other ones actually contain some salient stuff. So, you know, if you're doing it for this kind of analysis where you're like free to ignore some clusters and then let some clusters be the meaningful ones for you, I find that having a larger number of clusters um, can help, but there are metrics of like the average distance per cluster, et cetera, that you can use, um, and you can um, you can use sort of a, a more metrics based approach to that. Um, but um, you know, it's still a little bit of kind of a something you know a hyperparameter that you want to tune and kind of uh, I'd say it's a mix of metrics and part there. The code is not um, available on GitHub as of now. Um, the, um, the, this, I'll share the presentation though, and a lot of kind of the core bits of the code are there. You can grab. Um, depending on the tone of the word, it assigns values under sentiment analysis. Is there any particular predefined algorithm, or have you written any customized algorithm for it? 
Um, so I have not written um, Vader sentiment, but let's go ahead and look at, um, you can see there, I, I'm using this, um, this library here. So you can read a lot more about, about it. You can read, you know, so it's out under the MIT license. You can read what it, what it can and can't do. Um, and I think they've got their paper here that was originally associated with the project, I think is linked to from here somewhere. Um, and also I know somebody had asked about other languages earlier. Um, features and updates. I don't, I don't see anything on cursory examination here about other languages, but there might be some. How would you compare this stack with a Spark streaming stack in terms of, uh, terms of latency, ease, and features? Um, so Spark is great, and Spark um, has its own NLP package that is very good and very fast. Um, I was exploring, I was interested in exploring Apache Beam for this project, um, and I'm working with some clients who are GCP folks, and so uh, we do a lot of GCP work at our company, so working with Dataflow. Uh, like one of the real benefits of Apache Beam and Dataflow over Spark um, is that, you, it's more fully managed. You don't have to make some of those, like with Spark, when you're setting up a cluster, you're making some decisions about how many workers, um, how many preemptible workers, if you're using data proc on GCP, uh, which means that workers that it's like, if we can get these cheap, great, but I'm willing for somebody else to pull these workers away from me if they need them. Um, you know, so you're making more infrastructure decisions, infrastructure setup, and with data flow, you don't need to do that. You can just write the code and then fire it off and it determines how many workers it needs. If you're using the Java SDK, it can auto scale with streaming as well. So it's like if a large enough amount of data comes through, it can scale up or, and then it can scale down as necessary and different, um, different transforms within your pipeline can require a different number of workers. So if one part of the pipeline is particularly um, intensive, it can scale up to accommodate that. So, that's kind of a nice thing about how Apache Beam is designed and running that on Dataflow is you've got some flexibility there that, uh, so just kind of like removes some of that headache if you're just doing kind of like a one-off job uh, and you're not setting up like a permanent piece of infrastructure. It's nice not to have to worry about that, but otherwise Spark and Spark NLP is great. And I've seen a lot of very impressive um, NLP specific benchmarks with Spark NLP. All right, does the polarizing nature of these examples affect the performance of the sentiment analysis or clustering? The polarizing nature of these examples. Um, can you give a more, can you be a little more specific there? Um, by, by these examples, do you mean these example projects of like Game of Thrones and NBA? Or, um, I mean, because the polarizing nature of the text examples specifically, um, definitely affects the sentiment analysis. I mean, that's what it's attempting to discover is the, is the polarity around those things. Um, and then clustering, um, clustering, yeah, I mean, it should also, the, it's not as explicitly looking for positive and negative polarity of sentiment in the clustering, but it is still, you know, words like terrible and horrible would theoretically be clustered more tightly together in a good clustering tool than um, than other words, so they should both be affected by that. Um, I, on the sentiment analysis, like with having played with sentiment analysis a little bit more, like one of the things that I am starting to think of, as I kind of alluded to with some of the limitations before, um, I think in a lot of cases, um, well, it depends. With these entertain, entertainment-based things, like how engaged people are with the Raptors or and or with Game of Thrones, I think that I would start to just look at basically the absolute value, you know, just look at the positive and negative scores, um, maybe even sum them up or something that, that I think it's harder to interpret positivity from negativity and it's more just distance from neutral that I think is really interesting uh, if I were an HBO executive or, um, you know, somebody looking at NBA players as well. Um, it's, I think that is different when you get into like longer pieces of text or as I mentioned, like restaurant reviews, product reviews, et cetera, there I think you are able to see 
more, you know, when you're talking about a product, you either love it or you don't like it. And that's more clear. Um, emotional responses to entertainment, I think, are, you know, people love to hate stuff. People hate to love stuff. It's more complicated. So there, I think, just looking at raw emotion overall is kind of interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, so Daenerys Targaryen was killed by Jon Snow. Um, if, you, if that were to you know, be a thing, um, you, uh, that would probably be just a neutral statement. Okay, and pol polarizing reactions. I noticed the sentiment range was wide. Yeah, the, sen the sentiment range is from negative one to positive one uh, at its extremes. That's just kind of the metric. Um, how do you apply clustering? Uh, so clustering, I used um, that... Han Zhao's BERT as a service. Um, that's another great GitHub to look up. Um, BERT as service uh, provides a really easy to use. Um, like the easiest way to run it is just to run the server. So it's got a server and a client. You run the server as a Docker container is an easy way to run it. That's the code that's kind of, that'll be included in the presentation that we share in the slides. And then you, you have a client that's in whatever code you're wanting that's needing to read from that server. How did you get the 2D reduced um, T-SNE chart sort of by sentiment still maintaining the 2D plot? Um, so you, when you're running um, T-SNE, let's see if this is, this is the, I go back out here. Um, a sentiment, NBA finals topic clustering. Um, let's look at the t part here. So clustering, um, plotting on 2D. So you basically just tell t um, the number of components, basically the number of dimensions that you're interested in. So when I was reducing it to two dimensions, you just pass it the number of components to when I was interested in this other plot where I only wanted one dimension of clustering um, and the other dimension to be sentiment analysis, you basically just tell to, uh, TSNE to reduce it down to one dimension instead. Um, and you just, so you just pass that N number of components one. Uh, TSNE in this case is, I believe, imported from sklearn. Um, yeah, sklearn manifold TSNE. So, you know, know that you're losing, right, you're losing some nuance in, you know, if you're reducing, if you think about anything 3D down to 2D or even 1D, you know, you're, you're losing a lot. So know that you're, be, you're painting in very broad strokes at that point, but it's still useful. I mean, and it still does a pretty good job of keeping these light colored things, you know, close together. Thank you, Irina. Um, thanks for the note there. Uh, how is BERT different from word to vec BERT is similar to word to vec um, They're both uh, creating word embeddings. Um, BERT is just newer and uh, it's outperformed word to vec on a lot of NL various NLP tasks. So that's kind of one of the cool things about, you know, better word embeddings, right? How do you decide that word embeddings are better? Um, and that's actually being done by actually just using them in a bunch of different NLP tasks. And when BERT came out, it beat, you know, there was word to vec there was Glove, there was Elmo, um, and BERT beat a lot of them on a, on a variety of tasks, and therefore it's easier to say that it is indeed better. And now XLNet is kind of the new thing that's coming out. Um, uh, why use TSNE and not PCA was an earlier question. Uh, PCA, uh, well, basically TSNE is really designed for this plotting situation. If you're looking for, for primary components analysis, which is what's PCA, it's another sort, form of dimensionality reduction. Um, that um, if they go about things differently, and but primary components analysis is still great for a lot of tasks. And if you're interested in primarily the kind of continuing to use that within a model for the like the validity of the numerical values, I would use PCA. TSNE is uh, used specifically for plotting, just to make make things uh, line up nicely there. Um, how many different K in the K means? So that's basically the number of K in the K means is the number of clusters. I think I probably used 30 or something. Yeah, it's like 30 right there. Okay. Oh, and can you identify streaming issues, broadcasting, internet speed, et cetera, to isolate their weight if it's mostly unsupervised? Um, so um, let's see if I can interpret that. Um, 
So you do get some cool monitoring tools when you're using Dataflow that show you how many examples per second are being processed by each module, um, by each of the transformations in your graph. Um, and so you could, um, you could adjust based on that. Um, it does show you your latency, right? It shows you how far away from real time you are. And if you were getting far away from real time, um, you know, I think that's what it would use to know to do some of its auto scaling um, purposes. I think if you, were, if you were running it in Spark or something where you're defining the cluster itself, that's a key that you would, want to, that you would use to know to add more workers, et cetera. Um, did you have to create a set of topics and labels from the training data so that the classify unsupervised streaming text data into appropriate topic clusters? So no, with the topic clustering, you don't need to identify anything. Uh, it's purely unsupervised, and it will just take the words that it can interpret, right? And of course, you know, with, with Twitter, there's going to be a lot of words that it doesn't know, right? Misspellings, um, people's tw Twitter handles, et cetera, it'll usually... Um, assign like an un unknown vector to that. Um, but you don't need to assign that for that. For sentiment analysis, where we were interested in tracking particular entities, we did assign um, particular, we, you know, we had a list of entities that we were asking um, it to track. And we would even, you know, we even did, for example, Daenerys Targaryen, right, is a difficult name to spell. So we, we tracked a few different uh, spellings and misspellings of Daenerys, or just Danny. She's referred to in short, and um, and then we grouped those together and aggregated those metrics together. So you can do some kind of error catching like that. Okay, sure thing. All right, let's see if there's any. Um, so. Um, how do you apply clustering to a statement like Daenerys Targaryen was killed by Jon Snow? Um, so clustering is not really as related to, new, to sentiment. Um, clustering is based on those word embeddings that are more about the meaning, so killed, right? That if there was another sentence that said something, like you can think of it as like paraphrases, right? So if there was another thing that said like, you know, uh, Brienne, you know, was violent towards Tyrion, right? So if you, you know, that killed and violent towards, or um, maybe actually violent towards is even a little bit of a different thing, killed or hurt or maimed or attacked, that like violent action verbs would have a similar mathematical, a numerical representation in their vectors. And therefore, those words and sentences that are weighted around those words would be grouped similarly together. So the topic clustering is sort of separate from sentiment analysis. Um, you could, uh, you know, basically for our purposes, it's separate. Um, so clustering would automatically find similar words that are represented similarly in that numerical mathematical embedding space uh, and group those together. Uh, so by considering all the neutral sentiments as one cluster and positive sentiments and a second cluster and positive sentiments as a third cluster, how sentiment analysis and clustering you've applied in the project you showed on the slide. I just wanted to understand. Yeah, so like you, what you could do if you wanted to have things cluster by sentiment as well as the sort of sentiment, the, the sort of sentiment neutral pure topic clusterings, you could create another vector, right? So you could take the vector, the 768 dimensional vector that is returned by BERT, and you could concatenate the positive, neutral, and negative sentiment. And I have done this for some of that reviews stuff that I was talking about before. Um, so you can basically just add those sentiment values to the larger cluster, and you could even multiply that by a scalar or something to make those more important, um, and then then clustering would happen and take those particular values as well. So you can, um, you know, and that's used in a lot of machine learning work, right? Concatenating a variety of values into, um, into one model. Uh, so you, you could certainly do that. 
Uh, slide deck, definitely. There's, there's notebooks I haven't really prepared for GitHub, so, but I think a lot of the stuff you'll need it comes is in the slide deck, so you can get that from there. Earlier, someone asked a question about word embeddings and sentence embeddings. What are these? So word embeddings are, um, it's, it's a mathematical, it's a numerical representation of a word. So it, based on how that word is used in a sentence. So for example, um, if you say, I guess in that example that we said before, you know, let's take the words hit and, and kicked, right? Hit and kicked are used similarly in a lot of sentences. Somebody hit a ball, somebody kicked a ball. Um, and so um, it's, it's a lot to get into in kind of a short description and it's something that, that is definitely worth exploring further. Um, but the idea is that words that are used similarly get similar numeric representations. Um, you can do some math on them sometimes. It works out that things like, once you've got those numerical representations, if you take king minus man plus woman, you get queen. Um, you know, those kind of, that math is, is sometimes used to explain them, right? That's the, that you get these valid relationships of gender and things like that. Sometimes there, that's, there's also a lot of bias involved in that. And it's not like you could reliably invent those equations on your own. So I think that's not, it's interesting about them. It's an interesting side effect of word embeddings, but it's not really a good way to use them. But generally the, the idea is that they are ways of turning words into numerical representations um, that, uh, uh, that are a vector, right? So a list of numbers, uh, multi-dimensional representation. Um, that generally allow us to understand what words are used similarly, what words are similar to one another, and what words are far apart from one another. The slides will be shared for sure. All right, well, I know we're over time here. Um, so just wanted to say thanks so much to Bill and, and AI Camp. It's always fun to get to hop on and geek out about these things with folks. Thank you all for, for tuning in and watching as well. Um, feel free to, Hit me up on 